Hello, I'm Penelope Maver, and welcome to Earth Converse Podcast, an exploration into our relationship and conversations with the Earth, all in the hope of inspiring a deeper connection with ourselves, each other, and the Earth that is our home. And from the talks with guests about that dance of inner and outer worlds, I have been reminded of the beautiful provocation by our beloved Rumi. And you, when will you begin that long journey into yourself? And I will use this as the topic of this, our 11th episode. And I see this long journey into ourselves as multi-level. There's the big overall journey as a conscious human being on this earth, with little journeys and paths that are particularly significant en route. There are various stages of development and consciousness, and every second of our life is a potential moment of awareness and learning. But in this episode, I will start by offering eight particular experiences of mine where I have felt I have begun or have continued this journey. And I will not necessarily go to any depth or detail, but I offer them as opportunities for you to reflect on your journey into yourself, your own consciousness, the particular people, paths and processes that have helped and are helping you in your life. And as before, every so often, I will follow a particular reflection point with the forest sound. So pause at that point or not, it is up to you. So the first pause, to repeat Rumi, and you, when will you begin that long journey into yourself? What does this evoke in you? So talking through my experience in a linear way, I'll start with my journey in the teenage years. You know, those precious, turbulent years where we become self-conscious and dance between being a child and an adult. And I grew up as a teenager in rural Southland in New Zealand. And as many a teenager has done, I started a diary. You know, I used it to share my innermost thoughts, my dreams and feelings. It was full of poem and song and quotes. And I turned to horoscopes and other symbols to seek to understand to seek meaning, to get guidance on what to do and who to be. And I remember the time when I decided to get rid of the diary, that actually I needed to learn to communicate with others. And whilst this was and continues to be important and true, I also know how significant that diary was and could have been. I see now how journaling is such a gift to ourselves as a source of reflection and learning. In fact, I'm a passionate advocate for it as a leadership tool. And of course, keeping a journal is one thing, valuing the insights it brings is another. It can be a wonderful conversation we can have with ourselves, for it's a method to capture our thoughts, reflections and ideas on the events and experiences in our life. It helps us tune in to what we notice, helps us sense, check and give meaning to our experiences. It enables us to think critically about root causes of complex issues and connect theory with practice. It provides a means to recognise and identify patterns of behaviour, and can therefore transform our learning and reformulate our perspectives as we realise how our perceptions of the world may be constrained by our particular values and beliefs and assumptions. And it can build our confidence through an explicit recognition of our abilities, and can give us greater clarity about our areas of growth. Inevitably, it relieves tension and allows for re-energizing and renewal. And there's so many forms of journaling, including free flow or stream of consciousness, to the more structured, reflective practice. There's active imagination. I mean, you find the style that works for you. As Anais Nim beautifully said, we write to taste life twice, in the moment and in retrospect. Or Soren Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood backwards. And I wonder, to what extent do you journal or use writing as a way to reflect and learn? And the second experience is the big L word. It's all about love, as Gemma said in episode 7. Love in all its forms, self, romantic, family, community, spirit. Well, here I am talking about romantic love as I think that it's often the route to other forms of love. And indeed, a very universal, common way into consciousness. 
It's the ultimate workshop, is it not? <laughs> Everybody that we love and who loves us teaches us something, and I'm grateful to those in my life. I admire any couple who can step fully into their whole individual selves whilst being in an intimate relationship and partnership with another. I'm fascinated by this concept of solo togetherness, the dance of self and other. And my first adult experience of being in a partnership in the respect of sharing a home and a life was with Mo in my 20s. You know, it wasn't only just about learning about each other and what it is to be an adult in love, but he also, as a Māori, he introduced me to a different side of New Zealand to see my whiteness, the inequality that exists in the country and my role in that. And this is something that I will build on around Black Lives Matter, but to say through him, I also became more conscious of myself in relationship to my culture and beyond as a world citizen. And certainly, I started a journey into myself and an awareness about how we project on the other, about what we expect about the other, and realising, you know, it's always less about them and more about what is going on for us, our reactions, mindsets and heart set. To learn what are our triggers and how to navigate them, well, that is just a lifelong journey of trial and error, is it not? And the relationship also led to a path of understanding about self-love and learning to love oneself so that we can really truly love another. I mean, <laughs> love is an ongoing big reflection point, so I will just pause with the forest sound and you take as long as you need. <laughs> So another common part of adult life where we become more aware is through organisational life. As Roy White in episode 8 and I discussed, learning and development or the HR department in an organisation provides a social good because quite often it's them that provide us the first opportunity of structured development, of training, of a workshop, which then gives us an appetite to do more on our own. I mean, what development and training have you undertaken in an organisation which has raised your self-awareness and helped with your evolution? My first workshop was with the planning team where we explored the styles of conflict. I remember I was profiled as a teddy bear and my boss was a shark. <laughs> so as the profile suggests, you know, the teddy bear is accommodating can become a doormat, uses likability to build self-confidence. And the shark is competitive, courageous, but can be tactless. And you may have explored different profiling, like Myers-Briggs and DISC and those sorts of things. And these are, these are useful ways to describe ourselves, to see our patterns of behaviour, what the impact we have on others and how we can adapt our behaviour. They are useful lenses to see ourselves, but we don't have to be trapped by them. In fact, I believe you know we have potential to be all those types. In fact, I'm interested in helping people love their potential and step into this wholeness. For example, myself, embracing my sharkness in a positive way. Unfortunately, many companies do not have a real learning culture. People are expected to learn on the job, progress with minimal training, irregular performance reviews, and the occasional one-to-one -one with their boss, if they're lucky. I mean, as an aside, I actually believe that organisations could save a lot of money not employing consultants like myself if bosses had one-to-ones with their people. But, uh, but that's a topic for another time. My main point here is that I have realised that every workday, every moment we are working and being with others is a wonderful workshop, a wonderful moment, a wonderful opportunity to become more aware if we choose. And I remember at TEDx Roma, a cultural innovator, Sami Ismail, said, when you work 20 years in an office, you don't have 20 years experience. You have one year of experience repeated 20 times. <laughs> Indeed, are we just doing the same thing over and over or are we intentional and rigorous about learning from our experiences? In what ways are we mindful learners? With or without learning and development or human resources, organisational life brings opportunities for that journey inside ourselves. For sure, that workshop back in the planning team 
helped me on my path and planted the seed for the work I do. And so this curiosity of personal development got me down the self-help aisle, or as Sex and the City episode called it, the self-help aisle. This is the aisle in the bookstore full of earnest personal development advice. Usually you get there through some pain via breakup, health, job loss, a crisis of some point. For me, it was a breakup. And my first book like this was Tony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. It's no longer physically in my library, but there are still parts that resonate. I mean, we take what we want from books, don't we? And I remember getting excited and telling my sister, and she tells a funny story where she goes to our little town, the little bookstore Paper Plus, and slides up to the counter in a rather timid way and whispers to the assistant, Excuse me, have you got Awaken the Giant Within? And the assistant, not really picking up on the cues, repeats in her non-whispering voice, What? Awaken the giant within? You know, here's Hannah's cringing. And and then the woman, you know, does a computer search and she can't find it. And to Hannah's horror, she yells out to her colleague on the other side of the shop, Sharon, have we got Awaken the giant within? So I have this vision of Hannah sliding out of the bookstore without the book. (laughs) I love these books, these types of books. I mean, my bookshelf is full of these non-fiction types. To the detriment of reading fiction, I must say, and the classics. What did Mark Twain say about a classic? It's a book which people praise and don't read. (laughs) I mean, what can I say? You will have your books that have been significant to you. You Those ones that have moved you deeply, that have changed part of you have deepened your journey within, and which you enthusiastically recommend to friends. I mean, there's so much to say. I'll just use another author quote I found, this from Mortimer J. Adler. In the case of good books, the point is not to see how many of them you can get through, but rather how many can get through to you. And I wonder, which ones have got through to you? I love a good travel book, but it's no substitute for the real thing. So travel is the fifth I will mention as deepening my journey within. And it's big. I mean, by its definition, travel is a journey. It takes us from one place to another, literally and metaphorically. And I think for many of us, fortunate enough to travel by choice for pleasure, work, study, adventure, you know, it's a humbling and expansive experience. And for many young people, it's a rite of passage and Petra in episode 5 talked of her time in Italy, as did Catherine in episode 9. Christiane in episode 10 talked about her travels with her partner. The big OE, overseas experience, as we call it in New Zealand, you know, to leave home and venture out to foreign lands, well, that's a big part of our culture. And travel for me, you know, always reminds me of how kindness surrounds us where we're in an unfamiliar situation. It can be difficult. We're disorientated, stuck, confused. We're feeling incredibly vulnerable. At these times, a beacon of light will appear, usually in the form of an incredibly kind human being. I mean, is there more kindness when we travel? Or is it because in these situations we're seeing things differently? Our hearts are more open than usual. So we recognize kindness more clearly than we would when we're, if we're at home. In travel, we are reminded of the universal human qualities, as Roy talked about in episode 8. And there's also the wonder of diversity and difference, of learning that there are many truths and ways to see the world, and how we learn to see the world through other people's eyes. You know, to see your own culture, your own self, and how the world sees you. I mean, there's so much to say about travelling. And I like this by Anthony Bourdain. I will punctuate this with the forest sound, as it is a beautiful contemplation in itself. Travel isn't always pretty. It isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it hurts. It even breaks your heart. But that's okay. The journey changes you. It should change you. It leaves marks on your memory on your consciousness, on your heart, and on your body. You take something with you. Hopefully, you leave something good behind. 
on the travel theme, there's something profound about a solo, I'll say physical journey. It's the sixth experience for me. I've traveled solo for study, learning, work, pleasure. But my solo bike around Italy at the end of my MBA, my Master of Business Administration in International Business, was really a deeper experience. It's along the lines of what Petra talked about or Gemma's pilgrimage or Christiane in episode 10 about her big solo hike of the John Muir Trail. I called it my other MBA, my mini biking adventure where I biked and camped around Bala Italia. The trip was something I really felt compelled to do. I mean, it wasn't logical to embark on such an adventure instead of undertaking an internship like my colleagues did was seen as foolish. However, it did turn out to be a very meaningful personal growth project for me. And rather than explain, I will read the poem which I wrote to capture the sensations and experiences. So here it is. Through craggy cliffs, Lido-laden lungomars, marshy plains, industrial islands, charming cities and fire-threatened forests, from Trieste to Ticilia to Napoli and beyond, I have skimmed the rim of Italy, of cappuccinos and my right shoulder, savoured sights, smells, sounds and tastes from north to south, passed through beautiful places and passed up even more, shivered from the cold and sweated from the heat, sensed wind in my hair, sun on my face and pain on my butt, rushed downhill and from place to place, lost my way and a few bits and pieces, received whistles and toots as a joke, a warning or encouragement, sworn under my breath, lost my breath and held my breath, caught on lady luck and more often said fuck. I've broken equipment and communicated in broken Italian. I've gone to sleep to the sound of waves, trains, discos and storms. Had flat tyres, flat spirit, flat hair and been flattered. Been stared at, saluted at, smiled at and shouted at. Gullibly been taken for a ride and courageously ridden from dawn to dusk. Thought too much and thought nothing at all relished my solitude and been scared and saddened by it, trusted my gut instinct, used my head and followed my heart, decided on the toss of a coin and tossed the result, feared threats of hostility and been humbled by hospitality, met new people, experienced and learnt, suffered from frustration, exhaustion and confusion, but been more exhilarated, delighted and amazed. All in all, a fantastic MBA, my mini biking adventure. I can look back on that seven-week quest as one which tested my physical, psychological and emotional boundaries in an intense way. In many respects, it was one of those key turning points in my life, including how as a result it catapulted my leadership consultancy career in a new direction and a life in Italy. And what's What's your equivalent story? And from movement to stillness, meditation is the seventh. As I've expressed in episodes one and two, learning about and practicing meditation and mindfulness has really been fundamental for deepening my consciousness. Like my episode on Tara Brack or with Gemma and Catherine, you know, to meditate, to learn to sit with what is, well, it brings such gifts. It took me... 20 years to actually create a meditation practice after Rachel first told me about it. And it was John Kabat-Zinn who helped me really get going. He has been fundamental in bringing mindfulness to the West. And he beautifully plays on a familiar action slogan. He says, don't just do something, sit there. And in the Vipassana meditation retreats I go on, the primary instruction is... Do nothing perfectly, which takes some doing. We know this. You know, your mind starts wandering. It flicks between ruminating on the past or speculating about the future. It judges, evaluates, grasps onto thoughts as if they were the fixed truth, rushes from one idea to the next, desperately trying to solve problems. I mean, you don't have to sit on a meditation cushion to know this feeling. 
And you don't have to do meditation as a practice necessarily. It's just learning about being present. To do nothing perfectly is to lean into the stillness and silence and notice if an old fear or familiar trigger rises and choosing not to act on it, but just to observe it with self-compassion. So learning as a partner, as a friend, as a colleague, to do nothing perfectly can be the ultimate in acceptance. Other times it simply gives each other space, time and energy to gain perspective. As a coach, I've learned that to do nothing perfectly can be just the thing to create the necessary shift within the coaching relationship to help the coachee move deeper into self-awareness and resourcefulness. Indeed, what relationship, leadership dilemma or political decision has not benefited from taking up this challenge by Lao Tzu? Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? Here is an invitation to do nothing perfectly right now. So the eighth is the vision quest. You know, learning about connecting with my true nature in meditation, I naturally open to the idea of connecting with wider nature. And Al Harrison of Wild Courage first told me about vision quests, or vision fasts as they are often referred to. Again, it took me a number of years until it was the right time to actually do one. You've heard a number of my interviewees talk about their experience as participants and guides. And as promised, I will tell you of my experience. And here I will talk about the lead up to my first experience and including the medicine walk. And in another, I'll talk about the subsequent vision quest. And, you know, the lead up to it, meditation did play a big role. Learning to quieten my mind so I could be present and attentive and listen to my inner voice. I also worked through Soulcraft and Wild Mind, books from Bill Plotkin. And as mentioned in episode one, took this medicine walk. And a medicine walk, as Stephen and Foster and Meredith Little describe it, is a day's journey upon the face of the earth, a microcosmic life story. You know, it's a ceremony of preparation because the walk is the mirror. We do it one month before the vision quest, so we have time to digest the experience and use it as a metaphorical guide, as signs and symbols of what is important to you do appear. So this is the process of a day out in nature from dawn to dusk. You're alone, you're fasting, and you have an intention. I knew that I wanted to explore my feelings of grief from dad's death and the grief of a relationship. And I guess I really knew then I wanted to experience my darkness, to really look into myself in a deeper way, more so than I've ever done before. And it was funny, because my first obstacle on this particular day was actually getting out of the car. The lesson was there, already in motion, whilst I was stationary, enclosed in a tin can. I mean, the irony was incredible. I had travelled to um, Gorge Blue in Mallorca, a reservoir lake, and I'd already noticed that I was criticising myself for getting lost and scratching the car. And I was pulling up into this darkness, and I didn't want to get out of the car to go to the lake. It was pitch black. You know, there were the shadows of the trees. It was desolate. Nobody around. Well, I hoped nobody was around. You know, I was struck with fear about getting out of the car. And I'm not somebody scared by the dark. And I remember just breathing and doing step by step, bock a bock. I just breathed like, okay, open the door, open the car, put your hand on the, on the car door and just open. Put one foot out, then the other. Stand up. Grab your bag. Close the door and then do step by step. And I was really struck by how gripped of fear I had. And the day unfolded. And like I said on episode one, the experience of just being in nature, having no agenda or distraction, other than just observing, was a beautiful experience in connection and belonging. And I noticed how I saw everything in twos, from trees, sheep, 
clouds, birds, and how this stirred feelings of wanting to be in a partnership, and how I struggled with my own company, and how I also, again, relished it. And and also this pattern of all or nothing. I had fasted, and when I got home, I overate. You know, this was all part of the experience and all part of what was stirring in me. And I was just so curious. And so I sent my intention in a poem to the guides for the upcoming vision quest. Here it is. My soul is stirring. This vision quest I do yearn. Who knows what it will bring? Oh, how curious I am to learn. What parts will show up? What will remain in the dark? What light will I absorb? What transition will it mark? What will I discover? What thresholds will I cross? What will I let go of? What really will be my loss? What surprises will I find? What challenges will I meet? What will shake my inner core and land thump at my feet? What will lurk in the shadows? What mysteries will unfold? What capacities will I reclaim? What stories of wonder and wonder will be told? What will it mean for loving deeply? Love which I so long. And to offer greater gifts to Mother Earth? Will I hear my song? My questions may remain unanswered. These are many more. But my intent for this journey is to open up. So I will pause here and will continue my Vision Quest story in a future Earth Converse podcast. Looking forward to having you tune in again. In the meantime, enjoy Earth one conversation at a time. And this is the most important. That's why I do the work I do. If you find yourself pausing and reflecting, being in nature more, becoming more conscious, that's what matters. If you want to tell us about it on any of the social media platforms, super. But the most important thing is your own experience. Ciao for now. Thank <laughs> you.